University of China and at the Shenzhen Academy of Ro Robotics also in China. Okay. He works on multidisciplinary inter uh, research blending device physics with materials chemistry and electronic engineering with particular focus on intelligent devices and systems for sensing applications, wearable thermoelectrics, piezo piezoresistive sensors, and neuromorphic devices. He has published over 200 journal articles with H-index of 40, with uh, 6,000 plus citations, and has 21 uh, US international and Chinese patents. In 2019, he received a gold medal for his sensor platform at the 47th Inter International Exhibition of Inventions at Geneva. He is also a recipient of TRIL Research Fellow awarded by the International Center for Theoretical Physics uh, uh, at Trieste, Italy. And he's also the recipient of the Excellent Product Award for uh, four years at the China High Tech Fair Award awarded by the PRC's Ministry of Commerce. Uh, we are very, very lucky uh, and privileged to have uh, such a wonderful speaker. And please, sir, the floor is yours. Professor Roy? Yeah, yeah, can you yes. hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. yes. So, so you can yeah. start sharing the share, presentation. Share the yeah. Person now. Uh, your screen. Okay. It's fine. Can you no. see the screen? My screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. For you and for me is right at the noon. So welcome everyone and uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks to Vishal uh, for introducing me to this society I never heard of before. Um, uh, so thanks everyone for uh, organizing Sunil and uh, thanks for uh, introduction for Revati and and also thanks to Veda for explaining all the whole about the whole about the society. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, research to realization, how one can convert the molecular scale interaction into real time monitoring system. Okay, so you know, usually as a researcher uh, working in academia, you do research and publish papers, but we don't think beyond how it can impact the society. So uh, one of the things that we have, I have been very well involved in the past 10 years back in Hong Kong is how to get things out of the lab to impact the society. We have been involved with many companies. <clears throat> I, have, I was quite successful in getting grants from Innovation Technology Commission where it's not really that easy because you need in, uh, supporters or funders from equally sponsored from the industry. Industries only support if they can get some gain or profit in their business. You know, it's natural. So converting a lab technique into the producible or mass producible uh, devices that has impact into the society is not that easy. I found that you can publish in Nature and Science if you do two years of experiments with a lot of data and data analysis, but it's really hard to get something into the market. It's really, really hard that I have been experienced over the years. So here I'm going to give you some kind of glimpse of what we have been doing for the years. And I have just recently moved to Glasgow a year ago. And uh, once I moved in, it's the coronavirus epidemic and then we are locked down. But I can, uh, since I have my lab still running back in Hong Kong, my research activities are still active and going. I have still people in Hong Kong, something like 15 people around, several students. And, and now in Glasgow, the lab is opened and I have new guys coming inside, something like four PhD students and uh, senior engineers. Now it's not, the lab is functioning finally. So, now, 
get into the topic why we need to real time monitor the reason is we don't know what kind of environment we are living in is so polluted contaminated what you eat what you drink we never know what kind of air we breathe it's hard to say okay so how we end up into the society of where unknown diseases okay unknown cancers no one have an answer in industrially polluted countries you know like developing countries like in india or china you have so many cases nobody know what kind of disease it is so you all start from pollutants okay so monitoring is one of the important even i would say to mitigate and followed by remediation okay so that all like step by step need to happen it is assumed that global market you know something like 7.5 trillion by this year so it is keep growing the reason is you monitor different things at different part of the world like you monitor water food air okay and as well as now the epidemic you are monitoring virus oh my right now i had a project with a uh, turkish water authority where we send sensors to monitor viral particles in waste water uh, there was uh, okay the collaborators in turkey told me that in 1 liter they can found up to 10000 covid-19 particles okay and these particles you don't know some of them are active some of them are inactive okay so why we analyze, analyze waste water so if you have the number of viral particles in that particular region can tell you about the hot spot okay so how many people have possibly infected and what kind of remediation need to be taken so that's the main idea or criteria to proceed how we can find contaminated polluted area and how we can remediate so what kind of sensors we made is do agriculture for we help to analyze soil for different contaminate so one of the proposal that we are working on is with the eu is on persistent chemicals how we can analyze them and remediate them and so on and food safety i have been working for years and my prototype device i will show you the video how it works in the later part of the talk so it has been used in china for customs to screen the food whether it's safe or not but before getting into the uh, mainstream and drug trafficking is or again to monitor and different drugs at different various part of the uh, city or in the system organic pollutants contaminants again i told you including heavy metals okay monitor in water and soil and finally we um, expanded our system to healthcare one of my student now started a uh, startup back in hong kong funded by the government is to analyze urine samples we look for biomarkers from the urine and we have our device or sensors are running clinical trials now for prostate cancer to specifically identify those biomarkers from urine because it's non invasive uh, you are we are not taking talking about blood serum it's mainly from urine so you can one can analyze every day what kind of the level of uh, biomarker in the urine as well as you know if you go for treatment one can see how it varies over the day so mainly we would like to digitalize the data so this is based on the concept of digital economy you know we digitalize everything so once you digitalize the data you can do data analytics and <clears throat> machine learning tools to dig into more the system make it more smart and more selective and sensitive that's the overall idea of that so this is a way how our detection system work so i have people working on device physics and engineers and chemist working together with me so we 
specifically designed molecules that can bind to various target so whenever they bind into the uh, analyte and the target when they have bind together you have a kind of electropotential change that we screen with the transistor place platform because as you all know transistor is a very versatile structure you, one can analyze very low concentration because of high sensitivity that can induce at the channel because whatever is changed at the gate. I will talk more about the device structure, what kind of device structure later. So the one where you see here at the right side is a, a small analyzer and this is the sensor head or stripe you say. We functionalize the surface, okay, is how I interdigitated network of electrodes and functionalize on the surface of the electrode and we whenever there's a target attached to the receptor then this receptor and the target interaction produce the uh, electropotential change we can screen and we transfer everything to the mobile phone using an app so the idea is to convert everything into the get into the cloud and let the cloud intelligence take care of that. And we are talking about here in a place where a virtual doctors, so you can do all the analysis at home where the data can be transferred to the doctor and where the doctor can analyze the data and get back to you. So this is what the whole idea is. Now, when we talk about transistor, I have been working on transistor structure for, is now it's going to be 16 years. We, these are, some of the, I have been start working on semiconductors using different kind of uh, molecules and mainly conjugated system. And then I also work on some of the interface between the semiconductor and the gate, that's the dielectric. So try to understand how the charges can be induced and what kind of charge regime you have and how you can manipulate the transport between the source and drain. And we also try to develop a kind of uh, light emitting transistor uh, that you can see here that's with tunable emission. So these are my publication in the past, like 10 years ago, we have uh, all mainly on trans. And then we made, uh, once I started my faculty position, we simply make a complete printed array of uh, transistor, the ring oscillator, which is workable at 13.56 megahertz frequency. Now, when you talk about transistors, this is the MOSFET structure that everybody knows. Here, the most sensitive part is the interface between the semiconductor and insulator. So at the beginning of my career, what we did is we start to manipulate the interface with different functionalization. For example, we put a nanoparticle inside and see how the charges are trapped while moving from between source and drain. Okay, so th th that's kind of trapping and detrapping that we used as a memory device, transistor-based memory device. So this is the first beginning of us, and then we stay completely towards a flexible printed memory. So this is one of the things you see the memory on the right side is several kilobytes is printed memory we made in our lab. And these are some of my publication over the years mainly on memory devices. So again, we use transistors as a platform to read, write, and erase. So it's exactly how your flash memory works. We have all have a kind of a, you know, memory drive in hand. It's an amazing concept. You know, it's work exactly like your brain where when you sleep, you still there's a small potential in your brain may keep you things remember. And when you wake up in the next morning, you don't ask yourself, who are, am I, where, where I am, something like that, right? We all remember. So that's where the flash memory, you just read a, a small charges moving around there to keep it alive. So that was, uh, we worked on over the years on transit-based memories. These are our publications over the years, <clears throat> mainly on memory. So, what I show here. Then we start moving to a kind of 
think about artificial brain how a neuromorphic memory works so one can do a resistive based memory okay so what you can see here is two kind of structure you have just two electrodes and you can put those particles like what you see here coarsel structure whatsoever which can form a filament a conductive filament between top to bottom top electrode to bottom electrode so that can induce different kind of charge dynamics inside the device exactly how our brain works you know in synapses in your brain the neurons shoot and you have a kind of uh, you know for example is simply speaking you know i put a book in a library shelf okay so suddenly i want to take exactly the same book back to that now if i read every day i know the location but if you don't read it for a month then i need to think oh where i put it is exactly how our brain works so whatever you remember I mean you keep reminding yourself or some actions make you remind then you remember well otherwise you know that's kind of degradation because it's losing of charges exactly how the memory devices works now flash ram two kind of flash is basically a transistor based structure that way shown ram is resistive based structure now what we are want to do is photons as a light as a another terminal to manipulate the charge between the and uh, you inside the device to understand because you know light has important role even for us you you read under a white light or a blue light is different different way on the flight have a complete difference in of mood and the behavioral <coughs> response from human beings the first one we did is uh, photonic non volatile memory which again a transistor based structure but what we did is here using infrared to manipulate the charges so the infrared is a long wavelength okay you, you one can use it to uh manipulate charges somewhere really far away from you so what's the advantage because when you use infrared as is told as i said just now is long range communication the other thing is light can again manipulate or provide because light is uh, it's like quantum of particles that you have electron hole pair am i right so when you quench them electrons and holes can be separated which increases the amount of charge in a particular device so once you have more charge density then can have multiple level of data sets level 1 level 2 and so on so in of for example i have a the one of the flexible memory you can see on the right hand top corner if i can store one kb memory if you have two level of data set then you can have 2 kilo <coughs> byte memory okay right so that's what we try to manipulate with the light so any memory device we are talking about here is two kind of uh, parameters we look for one is whether how large it can store the data and number two is how long I means that's the retention of charges so these are the two terms whenever you talk about memory it always comes towards us so large in data size and the, the second one is longevity I mean the retention time how long you can keep the charges in because all these devices we don't use it for a couple of years they call lateral leakage the charges start to leak you will lose a little bit of data that you had so every time if you use it routinely you know you keep the charges inside intact so that's what we have been using for light as a photon to manipulate and we did one of the work is using different materials at layer by layer and use try to make a gate circuit just using light that what you see here is abc okay it's like a <clears throat> light tunable resistive random access memory and one of the advantages is a multiple data storage with the light because you have enhanced charge dynamics inside the device 
and then we okay you have light as a terminal then we straight ray expand into a biologically synaptic device so how in our brain the neuron transmit information from one neuron to the other neuron okay so that's that's we know synapse so when you have a more network of neurons that you can store basically more data that you have a large size of memory and human memory is of course is very dynamic and you can store multiple data multiple this what you know now our human brain works much faster and much more versatile if you compare with the computer architecture so that's why now computer architecture people try to move into van human architecture to how the neural network how human brain it works if we need to talk about plasticity of human brain that how synapses happen this two important things facilitation and a depression so it's a short term another one is a long term okay so it's all how uh fast you can retrieve the data as you said in the memory shelf you know you take the book how fast you remember okay so it's if you get stuck for short term you know you can really take it out very fast means you routinely using that particular object every now and then okay that's what we go into the neural computation so it's straight away moving to your human brain rather than using a one human bottleneck of computation that we are currently using it so as i said we this uh we are talking about uh, is one of our paper that we published on artificial neural network chips that how you can talk a yeah, solid state device can shoot like a synapse and then make artificial network and form like a memory or a human artificial brain so this is a fet based memory or you can use a mem resistor yeah filament formation like exactly how a neural neuron works to neurons form a filament to communicate with each other so this is a very simple ram that we construct make up made up of a uh, coarsel structure and uh, immersed in a pvp polymer and just two terminal okay so we try to put a pulse okay how long okay the pulse duration you require to get the same amount of data stored inside okay and then you remove the pulse and see the same current level how long it exists that's the forgetting process okay learning and forgetting so you just exactly like you stimulate your brain input certain data and then once you are not uh, thinking about that or reminding yourself that start to slowly decay this forgetting process so that's what we try to understand in device in fact this solid state but now my students back in hong kong they are working on more on electrochemical based device because our brain is electro full of electrochemistry all right so uh, this is how uh, we are moving towards ionic liquids that that can ions as well as electrons together transport and exactly imitating the brain okay so now this is one part of my research going on the neural network then we are extending to sensing application the same transistor structure so i have been fall in love with transistor for more than 16 years as i mentioned you know so how you can extend the transistor into sensing principle what we do is extend the gate okay so we call it the extended gate field effect transistor at the extended gate we put a transducer the transducer can be anything we have been using imprinting polymers okay to as a receptor to specifically bind with target and we have been using peptides for the covid-19 we made sensors that is all peptides uh we collaborate with one of our collaborating in glasgow and chemistry department andrew jamieson so he make those peptides for us and we also make aptamers uh that's also collaboration with one of the biochemist uh dr terence lau so the receptors can be any 
yes, it can be a small molecule or a polymer, aptamer, or peptides. So this is once functionalized or imprinted on the surface, then they are active enough to hook to the target that it's supposed to bind. So once they are binding, then the, the gate has electropotential change because of the binding, which we are screening up using the potential at the between source and drying. Because as I said always, whenever you induce charges, is so sensitive to pick up those charges at the interface. So when the charge is picked up by the interface, then we screen and measure the current. That's the overall uh, way we measure for external gate field effect transistor. So this is portable, handheld, and we can do sampling in the vapor phase or liquid phase. And what's selectivity? We this is specific to application what you want to detect and Sensitivity, we are able to go down to parts per billion. Okay, the detection time is, of course, instantaneous. And some of the devices you can wearable and flexible, you can use it. And we have been using this, such devices for these sort of applications, monitoring marine environment. Because one of my friend worked together with him back in Hong Kong, so we installed devices and in the in the marine environment to understand the marine oxygen level from morning to evening because marine oxygen is very important for uh, sea environment so we try to analyze from morning and evening how to change it what are the parameters it change so again we do then data analytics to analyze and agriculture products soil and water and food safety applications uh, uh, water quality of course we say water profile you know when you taste the water we drink water from you know as a human we can taste and see oh this water is a bit different that difference is like a you know you feel hard a soft nature but we don't have that sense what exactly inside the water is it contaminated heavy metals or any other toxic things there so we try to analyze profiling it and toxic gases drugs and finally as i said early cancer detection that we are working on now so we call it electrochemistry or electrochemical sensor. What is that? We are analyzing the chemistry on the surface. The surface chemistry is, is transferred or measured in terms of a electric response, either charge, voltage, current, whatsoever. And we pinch into the, uh, then we communicate using 5G or either network and use data analytics to analyze to make the system more smart and smart. So the identification that involves selectivity and specific binding, okay, that's very important. So the binding nature can be a coordinate binding or even hydrogen binding, okay. So if it is a, a covalent binding, one, once, you, because all the sensors, if you go down parts per billion, it's all once one time use, you know, once you test it and throw it away. So that's why these sensors need to be inexpensive. Uh, hydrogen bonding, there are some device hydrogen bonding where you can slightly heat it up and it released because it's not covalent bonding. You can easily release them back because Van der Waals na in nature. So that kind of binding, how you convert them in a measurable electrical quantity that's the challenge you know electrical transduction and signal processing there and you read it out and transmit them so this is the overall design that we use the first one let me talk about uh, excellent gate field effect trans for measuring lead in water so water can be contaminated but different you know is um, pesticides heavy metals from industry and you know, acid rinds and so on. And heavy metals get into the water, again, of course, industry pollution, but even by plumbing, you know. When the plumber connect the tubes, if they don't use proper plumbing materials, okay, uh, on the run, those 
plumbing materials can leach into the water. So that's why sometimes the water is contaminated with lead or chromium, such heavy metals. Now, how you can analyze this drinking water? You put an external gate and in the analyte binding, you know, that creates surface charge that you read out, all right? This is very sensitive, okay? That's what we are using transistor. And if you are, and you know, usually you avoid any failure mode in this structure because you extend everything outside the device. You are not functionalizing directly on the device. Transistor is just to collect whatever happening outside it. So this extended gate can be a one-time testing stripe. Okay, you just test it and throw it away. Now, in conventional way, people use ion selective membrane, but the problem is you to control the electric, the ion flow. How to suppress ion is very hard because one ion get inside, there are two ions on the other side getting from through the membrane. People usually control with the applying a voltage, okay, between that, but it's really out of control, you know, because you apply a voltage means what certain voltage we apply a really large voltage voltage this membrane can you know break apart so that's why we have a dual gate which can is just like a parallel device such circuit that it can adjust itself and suppress the flow of ions you can see every one ion get into the system for example one lead other side another lead get into the system so it's equally or balanced ion suppression so with that you can achieve really high level of sensitivity okay for example, is a single gate, is a dual gate. You can see that single gate, 100 microgram per liter. Here, one microgram, which is much lower than World Health Organization detection limit for lead. So this is a simple comparison for dual gate and a single gate. And then second example, I am going to give you some phthalate. Phthalate is a kind of a chemical we never able to get rid of. Every plastic bottle, every plastic container, we use to carry the food and water is full of phthalate. It's a plasticizer. So why we use phthalate? Because it to give the shape for the plastic. PVC has a lot of phthalates inside them, right? So, but it's a controlled chemical. Why is a controlled chemical? Because it disturbs neuroendocrine. It's a neuroendocrine disruptor. Especially for the kids, they have a plastic toy they lick the toy and it, those phthalates dissolve in the saliva and get into the system. And EPD in the US, it took them for 15 years to find out abnormal growth in babies, those who were born in 19, early 1990s. They found it took them 10, 15 years. In, they just found it in 2015 is because of a toy, a new toy came into the market in 1990s that has heavy amount of DHP, one of the phthalate cont I mean, uh, controlled chemical or controlled phthalate. Then immediately you, uh, followed by US, of course EU has already a regulation, Japan has a regulation. Uh, then uh, it takes time for US to understand has this regulation. And this phthalate is really damaging is to the not only human beings, but also the sea environment, because plastics everywhere nowadays. You take a food, and you got take away, for example, and they cook, it's really hot, and put into your container, which is plastic. And the plastic, if it has too much plasticizer inside, it migrate into your food, and we intake them. And that's what, it's not only as it affects the future generation, okay? because it's disturbed the totally neuroendocrine system. In the lab, you can use like GCMS or HPL CMS. This is our very well established laboratory techniques, okay? If you want to sue, some, sue someone in the court, you need this. But then, a yeah, manufacturer, toy manufacturer, or even I'm bringing a water at home, I want to see is there any plastic from a particular plastic bottle I purchased. I can have a, a simple test uh, at home if you have a test kit and I can use the mobile apps to control it. So this is what we make it.
So we what how we do that is molecular imprinted polymer. So you imprint the, those phthalates and extract them, polymerize it and extract them. So when the analytic rebind inside the pore, okay, that makes the electropotential change that we measure again using an excellent gate field effect transistor. You can see different concentration, we have different drain source current. And this is the way how is the temperate extraction and binding, you know, that produce the change, the electropotential change. Now this is a migration test. What we did is we take uh, artificial saliva and to replicate or simulate the sucking action of a children, okay. And then we try to analyze, compare ourselves with the mass spectroscopy. Uh, we spike them at around 40 microgram per liter, okay. And it's our uh, sensor, how it shows is around 37, 36, is, is close. You can see RSD is 2.67.8, which is comparable. You can see 37 here, our sensor, and GCMS 39. We are very close. Uh, so our device can be a very good pre screening tool, you know, before you intake. And the third example I show is a flexible histamine sensor. Is a kind of a pack we make with the mobile phone. This is the what companies that uh, which sponsor the project. They try to produce it now. So histamine is one of the biogenic amine commonly found in seafood and meat. Okay. So when the seafood. Uh, if it's not stored in a proper condition, so the bacteria start to digest histidine. It's one of the amino acid that once it start to the enzyme reaction, that histidine produces histamine. This is the reason why if you eat something, uh, you get allergic response. You go to see the doctor. The doctor immediately inject antihistamine to control the allergic response. So different part of the world has different. Uh, restriction. If you follow FDA, FDA has 500 ppm. If you take anything more than 500 ppm, you definitely end up in the hospital for food poisoning. So that's what the uh, histamine, how it works. And you know, it's, it's very serious uh, effect. Uh, at least this part of the world in Europe, people has even they can assume a cane tomato. The cane tomato has 50 level, 50 ppm of histamine inside. For, for us, it may have no effect, but there are people intake. They don't have an enzyme to digest. The enzyme to digest histamine is called diamino oxide, DAO. And if the body cannot produce enough DAO, you don't break histamine, which accumulates in your body. And over the time, you get allergic response. For example, I met a lady uh in 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 england and she said if she eat pasta tomato pasta cane tomato pasta for twice that night will be disaster for her, full of rash in her body and cannot sleep and vomiting and so on why because she does not have enough dao to digest the stomach so the dao is produced in the muscle in the joints of our body so that call these people are called muscle disorder patients so it's all related basically in the functioning of the body, how to produce an enzyme to break different things. Okay, so here is a video how we do it. Yeah, screening, pro we take our device to a wet market where they produce shrimps and meat. And we, uh, we just take a, a small amount of uh, meat, one gram measure, and known amount of water put inside and mince it and take a juice and drop it on our device and you can screen. Here we screen two things at the same time. One is histamine and one is formaldehyde because formaldehyde is inherited and uh, produced in seafood, but then some people you know, produce, inject formaldehyde to make it look fresh. But as you all know, formaldehyde is carcinogenic. So that's what we try to analyze these two.
So this is just a standard mincing procedure that you just known quantity. You just need a balance to know how much gram you're taking and mince it and use the apps to control our device. And you, the sensor stripe is on the right hand side. You drop the solution and we do it five times, you know, just to you have more data points, you make the system more select, I mean, sensitive. So collect five times the same thing, uh, same juice one by one. And we use the same device here. We don't need to change the stripe. And we use a standard addition method to calibrate. And all the data you, is stored in the mobile phone. And use NFC, near field communication, to transfer the data to your RFID tag uh, connected to the device with the stripe. OK? And see, the RFID data has all the data. You can put it on any pack. So the, you can use a mobile phone to screen. Oh, I have. Uh, <clears throat> so this is just to show how is a HPLC MS so big, so expensive, but we can do it with a small mobile app to control our device. <clears throat> so we uh, now some of my using the same transit plaster platform. We are analyzing single cells. It's one of the we you know we try to understand how cell progression happens over chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Okay, so when patients go for chemo, they analyze cells and see how the reaction. Okay. But if you need to have a lot of fluorescence, uh, first you need to dye the cell and using the first microscope and all this thing. Now, if you have a transistor platform and you poke the cell and see the progression, okay, it gives completed digitalized data that you can analyze. You know, now people are all talking about, as I said, digital health, digital policing, digital economy, everything digital. Why? We can analyze data using machine learning tool, uh, tools. And the cloud intelligence can give you more accurate. That's the reason uh, news in BBC weeks ago talking about radiologists will be no longer available in 10, 20 years. Why? Machine learning and AI can do much better job than a radiologist because you see the x-ray by eyes and analyze. But then AI, you have put all the data inside. So much data it can analyze, give you much more accurate. Um, diagnosis. So that's what now the. So we are working on this digitalizing all the data and do the machine learning skill to understand. So we summarize this point of care sensing technique. Okay, we use the external gate to analyze food, water, and now, as I said, we analyze urine samples for biomarkers. We are working on microRNA now to different microRNA. How? Because the whole body can be diagnosed with microRNAs. Every disease has its own set of microRNA code already in our body. If we can screen them, that will be the easiest way to find a disease in them much earlier. In addition to that, we also work on some electronic skin uh, that we try to imitate human fingers, like fingertip skin, because our fingertip is the one of the most sensitive. You know, you can touch and feel the temperature, surface texture, and so on. So we try to analyze, we make devices exactly mimicking fingertip skin. And we can, like an AFM tip, you can put on the surface and you can completely you know, uh, scan the whole surface. And we can also use to measure the human pulse. And I'm talking to cardiologists how to convert this into a real device to monitor pulse. Because now, you know, Apple Watch, I also have one Apple Watch in my hand, but it's all using infrared. So we are talking about it's a mechanical sensor. It's much more sensitive, pick up signals much more reliable. <clears throat> and that's what we are working on now. And it's going to also record vocal cord and so on. And thermoelectric skin, we are also working on uh, complete heat and electricity. I've been working on for the past eight years. 
I have six, uh, one, two, three, four PhD students working on this area. So the, we work on model materials engineering, how to dope and replace an atom to create a defect with a larger in size. Either it has a interstitial defect as a scatterer for phonons and electrons, or <clears throat> it sits inside the site. So that's what our basic physics there we are uh, trying to understand. We are publishing up 10 papers in just in one or two years, last year. And, but we make real systems out of it. We work with a bus company and then we make a system to convert a heat, past our, part of the heat from the exhaust to electricity. And also we have, is a, is a Peltier effect and Seebeck effect, am I right? So we use the uh, other way around to convert the heat uh, into electricity as well as the electricity into a solid state air conditioner. So we put in a lift. So a lift outside and inside, we can have 10 degrees of difference. Okay, <clears throat> so here you don't have a compressor. So you don't have a problem of water leakage and condensation and so on. It's a completely a solid state air conditioner with no compressor. So it's about solid state cooling system that you make using thermoelectric principles. So these are the two major projects that we worked on. <clears throat> and uh, so this is a wearable device that use such is a polymer based uh, thermoelectric materials that you observe the heat from the body to run your watch or mobile to charge. So these are our patents over the years and some of them are licensed and commercialized. And there's the people involved. So I have people around the world, you know, from Australia to, and majority of collaborators from uh, my collaborators are from China and in, uh, Hong Kong mainly Hong Kong based and uh, now very good friends collaborate in Edinburgh and Glasgow and in Sheffield and many European pro uh, partners because I have been living in Europe for some time. So a lot of European partners now on the years. This is my group. It was uh, my old group in Hong Kong. They did all this work, many companies and very kind enough to sponsor our projects and trying to commercialize the research. So I think I have 45 minutes now. Now we can open for discussion. Thank you very much. Um. Dr. Sunil, you will take the questions. Um, okay, I, I'll just read the first question, sir. It says, um, you can also see in the chat box, uh, vegetables, fruits are coated with chemicals to accelerate ripening. Let me, let me go to the chat box. Where is the chat box? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's right on top. You can see there. Ah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, vegetables, fruits are coated with chemicals to accelerate Reaping, yeah, for, for sure, yeah. Bad for health, illegal, or their domestic handle, affordable sensors developed in your lab. Or the, yeah, the vegetables is mainly they use a lot of, uh, you know, we try to analyze sulfates. Okay, so, and nitrates, the vegetables. So, uh, these vegetables, of course, we can make, but, you know, until now, nobody asked me, uh, or in any industry, came and knocked my door and say, we need this kind of device. And they're asking, but you know, we do, if it's really needed and we have a sponsor, we work on that, but it's feasible. It's not that uh, trivial to make such devices. Uh, we can monitor easily sulfates and nitrates to analyze this. <clears throat> that has market potential, of course. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but till now, no one approached me to make it for a commercialable product. So uh, I, I didn't really, spend time on that but it's feasible we have discussed this before with certain partners it's feasible another question from Visal: what is the resolution repeatability durability of transit based sensor compared to sensor that have interdigital electrodes ampere rate okay ampere uh, principle that we use it for uh, water quality for heavy metal analysis 
to simultaneously analyze four or five heavy metals at the same time so, so transistor based structures is good for specific targets and resolution of course it depends on what kind of res- receptor you put on the surface how is bind okay if the binding nature it can specific of course tra- trans is just a transducer read out and get you the signal and these are all as i said extend gate is a one time use use it one time and throw it away okay so we don't question about here how we repeat you you are not going to use multiple times looking for parts per billion you know nobody want to use it again because these are all binding sites it bind you are slowly filling the binding site so the background noise will level go up so we never ask them to use it multiple times just use it once and get it out of that so that's durability of course if you use imprinted polymers they are really like ceramics you can work at any temperature any conditions it's not a problem at all so ampere uh, ampermetric principle is used but you can't you can't go down to parts per billion level of sensitivity okay so because you need to have a specific binding target so this um uh one of the things yeah, is a comparison when you compare it and 2d materials people have been working on graphene or this is all good for paper publication okay you can publish but i am talking about realization can it be realized in a device that everybody can use it that's a different story now, of course 2d materials good for materials research for research and then you can publish papers and so on uh commercial ability this uh, yeah need to think about that it's not i don't see it <clears throat> not it commercialized really there are some graphene based inks you know for electrodes uh this commercial available so that's we need still need to but uh, i don't know whether it takes some years to go or yeah so uh, any questions more uh and this is sir uh, so there is one more question yeah. mm. in the peltier plates what is the top and bottom stretchable sheets by uh, uh, dr vikram what is the top and bottom stretchable sheets you mean uh, the electrodes uh, in the peltier plates i mean the electrodes or what is the top uh, and bottom stretch yeah, dr vikram uh, can you yeah. unmute yourself yeah, and... know, like, what is the material say generally we use the ceramics right sir yeah so uh, if it is uh, stretchable yeah. sheets a uh, flexible peltier we don't use ceramics we use a uh, composites polymers mixed with uh, 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 our main material is zinc antimony okay this is what we have papers on zinc antimony and uh, uh, based and mainly antimony based materials uh you can check my publication so the we that this paper is published on journal of power source just this year is a, uh, what we did is either we use composite or we also use simply deposit vacuum evaporate on a polymer substrate because uh, like bismuth telluride or any other uh, thermoelectric material they are sublimable so you can sublime it and form electrode on the surface electrodes can be anything uh, gold or silver or sometimes even you can use carbon ink um, the next question is by anup vibhute uh, the question is please comment on soil sensors so uh, i means request, what comment yeah that's what uh, i request anup uh, please uh, can you unmute yourself and uh, good evening sir uh, uh, what kind of sensors we can apply for the soil uh, so that we can measure the soil nutrients oh nutrients again we you know nutrients means there are many we can you know even minerals uh, including specifically specifically macronutrients we are, we are talking about mm, means is uh, macro means uh, uh, you are talking about bacterial growth or 
no no uh, or enzymatic uh, npk type of uh, nutrients we are talking about uh, nitrogen phosphorus potassium okay uh, so this are minerals okay this is all you can use again a simple way to measure it is ampliometric mm-hmm. you can uh, total uh, phosphoric content nitrate content in the soil okay you can use ampliometric kind of sensing uh, which okay. can uh, in parallel can measure everything okay so of course you can also use a transistor array okay yeah uh, to me- to signal process or screen these main three uh, minerals in the soil but mm-hmm. what we do is we use a robotic arm to collect the soil and uh, disperse it in this uh, dins water and then use a kind of uh, a striping voltmetry principle to stripe uh, different ions to analyze okay Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor Atre, sir, uh, would you like to uh, ask anything? No, so no. We can use... Um, Excellent, the, the, the question is, how many of these uh, point-of-care uh, units have been uh, commercialized? Any of them yet? We have, one is on prostate cancer. We are doing a clinical trial now. we analyze biogenic amine uh, in the urine as well as uh, <clears throat> prostate specific antigen psa now in glasgow hospital we are working together with urologist that uh, we are running clinical trial because we need data at least thousands of data to have a, uh, you make the system even more smart because the you know when you collect urine samples from morning to evening you have you know it can be over the day it can be diluted concentrated depends on what the patient is eating and what kind of uh, medication is taking on so it really need a lot amount of data to analyze and then input the system so that what we are doing so clinical trial is already going now you know it's going on now so it may take year or two to get it completely in, uh, into the uh, for for regular check up for the patients tell me this uh, ca- cardiac ma- monitoring unit you were talking about does it analyze the blood proteins like myoglobin troponin or some some kind of thing like that no we are measuring mainly the pulse and the pressure blood pressure because we tried something like a very quick monitoring uh, the rate of change of myoglobin and troponin and seeing whether with a point of care unit could be t- done in remote areas of india Mm, but that's use the light like infrared. Mm. infrared amount, oh, right? infrared infrared am right thank you sorry it is infrared you use infrared to analyze am right sorry disconnect problem yeah and uh, answer sir please yeah. uh professor velaswami thanks for taking the time to uh, give this seminar and uh, thanks for uh, telling us about uh, the translational research and how you successfully have done this i have one question so i think with your chemistry background uh, getting into this uh, would be uh, i think uh, a very unique exercise i think that uh, i compliment you for doing this uh, i have the question that i have is that when you have uh, a sensor concept validated in the laboratory and finally we would commercialize that's not an easy thing i know uh, but how much of the concept itself would change in that process that is everything that we think works in the lab is not necessarily going to work in the market for sure sometimes you have to tweak it so in the example that you have given you can pick any one uh, where substantially more research uh, became necessary in the process of translation does it happen often it's- in your experience it depends on what the industry you know when we plan first we always plan whether it is a industry process that you can mass commercialize mm-hmm. so we we you know is a kind of uh, uh, bottom up approach when you mm-hmm. when you design it we already designed at the bottom level what the top layer needs mm-hmm. for commercialization mm-hmm. uh, for sometimes you can succeed for sometimes you can't because some of the materials really can produce mass production 
and uh, for example you know i the, for the drug sensing we are targeting five illicit drugs mm -hmm. okay so what happened is um for, for for some of for ketamine we can make a very easy uh, uh molecule that can that can covalently bind okay so that's not a big deal then when you go for heroin or cocaine these are natural product mm -hmm. Okay, so then we start to imprint it. Imprinting is very good, but then how you convert it into the the sensitivity is in parts per uh, billion. If you want, spot, you know, for if you want to replace a sniffer dog, the dog gets parts per trillion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it still is fine, but then we use aptamer. Then aptamer is much more specific. You can go for parts per trillion, mm -hmm. but then aptamer is not stable. You can't use it in any environment. If it's more than 50 degree, it denature. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of uh, pros and cons when you think about what exactly is not everything can be moved right away. Is you know success rate is really less than five percentage. You can right. succeed. So that, is really, that is the reason why many academics don't go that route. Yeah. So is the 95 percentage, you know, you end up in publishing in a paper and you're happy with that. OK, thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, let us uh, stop here. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Professor Roy, uh, for taking time and giving a wonderful presentation. And uh, the next talk will be on December 23rd by Professor Wim, uh, who is from uh, University of uh, Hazelt, Belgium. Uh, he speaks about on uh, ultrasonic spray coating as a versatile technique in the large area deposition. So looking forward, uh, everyone, to see you again. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Thanks, Thank you, Professor Roy. Thanks for everyone.